The Ideal Wife, by Mary Balog. Chapter 1 If you could set before me the plainest, dullest, most ordinary female in London, Mars Ripley, Earl of Seven said, or in England, for that matter, I would make her an offer without further ado. Sir Gerald Stapleton laughed and drained off the final mouthful of brandy left in his glass. It would be better to be like me, Miles, he said, and just tell the world in no uncertain terms that you will remain a bachelor as long as you please, and that that will be for a lifetime. Thank you kindly. The Earl sighed and hooked one leg over the arm of the chair on which he sat. The speaks a mere baronet he said, a man without a care in the world. I was one myself until fifteen months ago, Ja, and I used to complain about lack of funds and consequence. I was living in heaven and did not realize it. His friend hauled himself to his feet with an effort and crossed the crowded and rather untidy bachelor room that he rented close to St. James's Street to the brandy decanter. His neck cloth had already been abandoned and his shirt was unbuttoned at the throat. It was late at night, the two men having left White's a few hours before. If that was heaven, you could be living now in a far greater paradise, he said. You have inherited an earl's title and the three estates to go with it. You have more money than a whole army of princes should decently possess. You are thirty years old, in the very prime of life, and of course you still have those looks which have been throwing females into the flutters and the vapors for the past ten years or so. You have forgotten my most important possession, Lord Seven said gloomily. His brandy was still untouched in a glass at his side. My mother and my sisters, they are going to be here within the week, Ja, all three of them, and I am going to be leg shackled within the month. I can hear the chains rattling already, nonsense. Sir Gerald said, all you have to do, is say no. You are the head of your family, aren't you? The man of the family? Ah, the Earl said, the speaks a man with no female relatives. Things are not nearly as simple as that, Ja. They worshipped and coddled me all through my growing years, especially after my father died when I was twelve. They have worshipped and loved me through my adulthood and now they are preparing to show me the ultimate sign of their love, they are going to give me away to another female. Sir Gerald yawned and sipped on his fresh glass of brandy. You have to stand up to them, old chap, he said. Listen to the advice of someone all of one month your senior, you have to make clear to them that they cannot have your life in exchange for their love. You can't get married, Miles. What is she like, anyway, Francis? The Earl thought for a moment, exquisitely lovely, actually, all blonde ringlets and wide blue eyes and pouting rosebud lips. Has her father and her brothers and all their men servants and the village vicar eating out of her hand, she is eighteen years old and about to descend on London to be the belle of the season and carry off the man of a most impressive rank and fortune available, me. As it turns out, his friend grimaced. Let's run off to America, he said, to seek our fortunes. But of course, you already have a fortune. Don't do it, Miles. A man does not know how weak he is until confronted by a parcel of determined and well-meaning female relations, I swear, Lord Seven said. Am I a weakling, Ja? Am I a doormat? I spent a month at Galloway's before coming here two months ago. I went with my mother and Connie, the Galloways have always been particular friends of my mother's, and I found myself lifting Frances up and down from saddles and in and out of carriages, she could never seem to use the steps, and carrying her gloves and her salter in and out of church and plucking posies of buttercups and daisies for her to bury her pretty nose in, and doing so many other things that I cringe at the very memory. They are going to have me married to her before the season is out. And there is not a mortal thing I can do about it. I think we had better run off to America, fortune or no fortune, his friend said, downing the remaining contents of his glass and getting to his feet again. I could feel the noose tightening almost as soon as I had set foot in Galloway's house, 
the Earl said, it was glaringly obvious why I had been invited there and why Mama had brought me there. It's amazing I escaped at the end of the month without being trapped into some declaration. But now my mother insists in her letter that there was a tacit understanding and that she can scarce wait for it to be made official. Tacit, ja. What does the word mean, pray? Galloway and the girl are coming soon too? Sir Gerald asked. They are all going to be here within the week, Lord Seven said. And I have the feeling that they are all going to act as if Francis and I have that tacit understanding, whatever it means. I know what it means, actually. It means that we are going to be planning a wedding at St. George's before the month is out, and I am going to be done for. Shall I find out what ships are in dock? Sir Gerald asked. The trouble is, the Earl said that I will feel honour ground. I hate honour, Ja. It always means having to do something one does not wish to do, usually something painful as well as unpleasant. I won't even have to open my mouth to be trapped. I have less than a week of freedom left. I still think you ought just to say a firm no, his friend said. As soon as your mamma sets foot in your house, Miles, just say to her straight out. I am not marrying Francis. Nothing could be simpler. The very simplest thing would be to marry someone else, the Earl said. Run off with her or marry her by special license before my mother even gets here. That's what I ought to do. How did you describe her? Sir Gerald chuckled. Plain, dull, very ordinary. Is that what you said? Why not a beauty while you are at it, Miles? Because beautiful women are invariably vain. Lord Seven said, and think that men were created to fetch and carry for them. No, Ja, my ideal woman is someone who would be nice and quiet, who would be content to live somewhere in the country and be visited once or twice a year. Someone who would produce an heir with the minimum of fuss. Someone who would make all the matchmaking mamas, including my own, fold up their tents and go home. Someone who would quickly fade into the background of my life, someone I could forget was there. Does that not sound like bliss? Better still to have no one even in the background, Sir Gerald said. That seems not to be an option. The Earl of Seven got to his feet. I should be going. It must be fiendishly late. I had better go to Jenny and enjoy myself while I still can. Sir Gerald frowned. You don't mean you are going to give up Jenny when you marry Francis? he said, Miles, you are the envy of the whole membership of Whites and probably that of the other clubs too. There aren't many who could afford her, and not many even of those that she would cast a second look at. Let's not talk any more tonight about my marrying Francis, the Earl said, picking up his hat and cane from a chair by the door. Perhaps I will meet that woman of my dreams within the next week, Ja. Perhaps I will be saved yet. It's all very well to talk, his friend said, yawning loudly and stretching. But you wouldn't marry such a creature, Miles, admitted. Oh, wouldn't I? Lord Seven said. A nice quiet, demure female, Ja. She sounds far preferable to what I am facing. Good night. Give Jenny my love, Sir Gerald said. It had been very late when the Earl arrived at the house where he kept his mistress, and Jenny, having been woken from sleep, had been warm and amorous and it kept him busy until dawn was already lighting her bedchamber. He had slept until well into the morning. This was the part of having a mistress that he always liked least, he thought as his steps took him finally on to Grosvenor Square and to the door of the house he had inherited with his title more than a year before. He hated walking home in crumpled evening clothes, feeling tired and lethargic, Jenny's heavy perfume teasing his nostrils from his own clothes and skin. He looked forward to having a hot and soapy bath and a brisk ride in the park. But no, it was too late to ride in the park at more than a walk. He would go to Jackson's boxing saloon. Perhaps he would find someone worth sparring with someone to put energy back into his muscles. He handed his hat and cane to his butler when he entered the house and directed that hot water be sent up to his dressing room without delay, but his steps were halted as he turned to the staircase. There is a lady in the yellow salon waiting to speak with you, my lord, the butler said, 
his voice stiff and disapproving. The Earl frowned. Did you not tell her that I was from home? He asked. His butler bowed. She expressed her intention of waiting for your return, my lord, he said. She says she is your cousin, Miss Abigail Gardner. Lord Seven continued to frown. It was possible, in the two months since he had been in London, having completed his year of mourning for the old Earl, who was a second cousin of his father's, and whom he had not known, he had met numerous relatives, almost all of them poor, almost all of them with favours to ask, dealing with them was one of the burdens of his new position that he had not expected, he hesitated, should he merely instruct Watson to pay the woman off, but number, she would doubtless be back again the next week, palm extended, he must speak with her himself, make clear that whatever gift he gave her would be for that one occasion only, that her claim to kinship did not make him responsible for supporting her for life, he sighed, if she is prepared to wait, he said, then wait she must, I will speak with her after my bath, Watson, he turned without further ado and ran up the stairs to his room, he was still feeling depressed after his mother's letter of the day before and after his evening with Gerald, and he was tired after his night with Jenny. Miss Abigail Gardiner would leave the house if she were wise, and not risk facing his morose mood, he frowned in thought. Gardiner, were the relatives of that name? If there were, he had never met any of them, but doubtless the woman would be armed with a family tree to prove his obligation to give her charity. Almost an hour passed before he was back downstairs, nodding to his butler to open the doors into the yellow salon. If earldoms and all they brought with them could be hurled into the ocean and drowned, he thought grimly, he would row to the deepest part of it he could find and tie granite rocks about his before tipping it overboard. Miss Abigail Gardner, he saw at a glance, was younger than he had expected. From her name he had expected a thin and elderly and sharp-nosed spinster. This woman was no older than five and twenty. She was dressed decently but plainly in brown. There was a faint hint of shabbiness about her clothes. Certainly they had not been made by a fashionable modist. She was a very ordinary-looking young lady, her brown hair smooth beneath her bonnet and almost the same color as it her features quite unremarkable. She had no maid or female companion with her, she was standing quietly in the middle of the room, her hands folded in front of her. He wondered if she had stood there the whole time or if she had sat on one of the chairs for a while. She looked remarkably, he thought, and the thought afforded him the first amusement he had felt for more than twenty-four hours, like the ideal woman he had described to Gerald the evening before except that the ideal did not look quite as appealing when it was standing before him in real flesh and blood. He set one hand behind his back and raised his quizzing glass to his eye with the other. He favoured the woman with the look he had acquired in the past two months as the one best suited to dealing with would-be dependents and hangers-on. She curtsied to him but did not, as several of her predecessors had done continued to bob up and down like a cork. Miss Gardner, he said, what may I do for you, ma'am? You must dress plainly, Laura Seymour said, not shabbily, of course, but not too prettily either, Abby. Abigail Gardner chuckled, that should not be difficult, she said, the only clothes I possess that might be described as pretty are at least ten years out of date. Will my brown do, do you think, admirably? Her friend said, and, Abby, remember, what we decided last night, you must act demurely, you really must. I cannot emphasize it enough, he will not be impressed if you are bold. Abigail grimaced, bobbing curtsies and directing my gaze at the toes of his boots and not speaking until I am spoken to and all that? She said, must I really, Laura? Can I not be merely myself? One curtsy. Laura said, and I think you may look him in the eye, Abby, provided you do not stare at him boldly as if daring him to gaze back without being the first to drop his eyes. As I did with Mr. Gill the day before yesterday, Abigail said, and both young ladies exploded into smothered mirth. His face, Abby, 
when you spoke to him as you did in the schoolroom. Laura held her nose in an attempt to contain her laughter. Sir, Abigail allowed her bosom to swell, placed her hands on her hips, and glared coldly at an imaginary Mr. Gill at the other side of her small bedchamber on the second floor of that gentleman's townhouse. Your behavior is quite, quite intolerable. She sucked in her cheeks in an effort not to laugh and ruin the reenactment of the scene that had taken place in the schoolroom two days before when she had entered the room in order to save her governess friend from molestation, the children not being in there at the time. If I see you one more time pee pee pinching Miss Seymour's bow, bow, bottom. Laura rolled backward onto the bed and gave up her attempt to imitate the cold accents of her friend. Abigail doubled over where she stood, both gave in to gales of laughter and soon had tears running down their cheeks. Abigail took a deep breath and straightened up, then I shall pin, they both howled, with laughter, pinch yours, sir. Abigail clutched at her stomach, oh, it hurts, she wailed. I had no idea what words were going to come out of my mouth, Laura, until I heard them for myself. Can you imagine what a delight it would be to pinch Mr. Jill's Derricka? Her friend was laughing too hard to answer the question. Abigail straightened up again. It is not funny, she said at last, sobering. It really isn't, Laura. I have been dismissed without a character and with only one week's notice. On the pretext that I have been ogling Humphrey, Humphrey, I would rather ogle a crocodile or a fish than Humphrey Gill, he has an entirely suitable name, by the way, I must say I am not broken hearted not to be companion to Mrs Gill any longer, peevish, vaporish women make me so cross that I could scream, especially when one knows that they are merely trying to imitate the nobility, but still and all, to be out of work with no character. Laura, it is definitely not funny. Laura got up off the bed and smoothed out her dress. She looked at her friend from contrite dark brown eyes. Her pretty auburn hair was in disarray. And all on account of me, she said. I am so sorry, Abby, but when I asked you to keep an eye on me whenever Mr. Gill was on the prowl, I had no idea that I would end up getting you dismissed. I will still go to Mrs. Gill with the truth if you will but let me. Abigail clucked her tongue, absolutely not, she said, both of us would be out on the street instead of just me, you would not win a reprieve for me by telling all, you know, the only thing I feel sorry about is that you will be left here defenseless, you will just have to cling to the little gills all day long, Laura, so that fond papa can never get you alone, and you must learn to assert yourself, oh, Abby. Laura clutched her hands to her bosom and looked unhappily at her friend. Do you think your cousin will help you? I had no idea the Earl of Seven was your cousin. He is very, very rich, so it is said. Abigail frowned. Actually, she said, I think it is a gross stretching of the truth to call him a cousin. Laura, he is a relative, that is all. But then, I dare say everyone is a relative if one is diligent enough to trace one's family tree back to Adam, and I really am getting cold feet about going to see him. I hate begging, indeed, I don't believe I can do it. I will have to think of something else. Oh, but what? Laura asked, I could go back into Sussex if I have enough money for the stage, Abigail said and grovel to Vicar Grimes and persuade him to find me another post. He found me this one. But I don't believe I could stand another job quite like this. He thought highly of the gills. Oh, dear, Laura said. Perhaps he did not know them well, or I could become an actress or a whore, I suppose, Abigail said. Laura gasped and clapped one hand over her mouth. Abby, I suppose it will have to be Lord Seven, Abigail said. There is no point in searching Boris out, he cannot help me, he is living by his wits and does not need the added burden of my problems. Go, then, Laura said, surely the Earl will help you. You are not planning to ask for money, after all. But do remember to behave demurely. Oh, don't forget, Abby, we are back to the curtsy bobbing and the gazing at boots, are we? 
Abigail said. She positioned herself with feet firmly planted on the floor a few inches apart. She straightened her shoulders and composed her features to blandness. She sank into a deep curtsy. Is that good enough? Perhaps if you are at court being presented to the Queen, Laura said. Abigail frowned before blanking her expression again. How about this? She asked, curtsying a little less deeply and raising her chin. The curtsy is good, if a little stiff, Laura said. The look appears rather as if you are challenging me to a duel. They both collapsed into laughter again for a few moments. It is the chin, Laura said. Make sure it does not jut, Abby. Abigail practiced the routine a few more times until Laura approved. You are the head of my family, sir, and must help me, if you please, Abigail said. Laura sighed and sat down on the edge of the bed. Your chin is jutting again, Abby, she said. And there is a definite martial gleam in your eye. And must you not address him as a my lord? And must you sound as if you are demanding help as of right? Despite the A if you please at the end, I might as well forget it, Abigail said. I would never be a good actress, Laura, either with my cousin or on the stage. What does that leave me? Sit down, Abby, Laura said. It is going to be time for Billy and Hortense to come to the schoolroom soon for their morning lessons. Let us try to get this just right. The Earl of Seven must not be given an unfavorable impression of you. So I must cringe and demean myself, Abigail said. I shall die of mortification anyway. No, not that, her friend said. You must be, she waved a hand in the air. Oh, demure, Abigail said. Very well, then, it shall be done. Tell me how to do it. There has never been anyone more meek and mild than I will be. Less than half an hour later the governess had left for her morning duties in the schoolroom and Abigail was left alone to get herself ready for the visit to the Earl of Seven's house on Grosvenor Square. She really ought not to be doing this, she thought as she set out on her way. It was quite outside her nature to grovel, and that was what she would be doing. However carefully she followed Laura's instructions, she was going to ask a stranger to help her find another position, on the very slim grounds that he was her kinsman. They were very slim grounds, Papa had had no dealings with the Earl or his close family, and if the Earl knew anything about her family, the chances were that she would find herself outside his door on her ear with great haste. It was not a reputable family, Papa had not been reputable and there were other facts and events that would make any self-respecting nobleman's hair stand on end. She would just have to hope that he did not know anything about the gardeners, or that age had tampered with his memory. If she were fortunate, he would have snowy white hair and bushy white eyebrows and a kindly smile and all she would have to do would be to say what she had rehearsed with Laura and look meek and demure and helpless. She just hoped that he would not do so doddering with age that he would be incapable of listening to her with any intelligence at all. She hoped she would not have to deal with a young and sharp-brained secretary. She would not think of it, she thought as she approached Grosvenor Square and tried not to notice quite how grand the houses surrounding it looked. She walked resolutely up the steps to the Earl's house and lifted the brass knocker. She remembered just before the door opened to pull in her chin and soften her expression. And oh, Lord, she thought a few minutes later when she had forgotten herself enough to stand up to his lordship's starchy butler and inform him in so many words that she did not for a moment believe that the Earl was from home. It was a grand house. The salon was clearly used only for the reception of visitors. The chairs were not arranged about the room in any pleasing or cosy design, they were set about the walls. She did not seat herself on any of them, the wait was interminable. She wandered about the room, looking at all the paintings, afraid to sit down lest she be caught at a disadvantage if the door should open without warning. Perhaps she should have asked the butler if his lordship was expected home within the week. She began to fear that she had been forgotten about and would be remembered when a parlour maid came in to dust the next morning or the morning after that. But finally the double doors opened and the butler, who stood between them for a moment, 
stepped aside to admit a tall young man. Abigail's heart slipped all the way down inside her half boots. She was not to be admitted to his lordship's presence after all. She was going to have to deal with a secretary, who looked as stiff and frosty as any duke one would care to imagine and who had the effrontery to lift a quizzing glass to his eye and survey her through it. Through a superhuman effort she retained the stance that Laura had approved of. If she could not impress the secretary, there was only one of two other possibilities, Vicar Grimes or the London job that was not being an actress. She was forced to waste the curtsy she had practiced with such care on a man who was as much a servant as she was. She stood quietly and looked calmly at him. And she was very aware suddenly of her lone state. A gentlewoman in the receiving salon of a gentleman's establishment with nary a chaperone on the premises. Miss Gardner, the secretary said, looking at her with a disdain he did nothing to disguise. What may I do for you, ma'am? End of chapter 1